Amen. As I was giving my verses to the media team, somebody asked me if I'm going to preach the whole Bible today. And so with that, let's turn to Genesis 1 and 1. And before this is done, we'll be in Revelation. Don't worry. I've got somewhere to be today uh, in a city three hours away. Please remember to keep uh, the Benjamin family and Calvary United Pentecostal Church of Pierre, South Dakota, in your prayers. Today is the memorial service for uh, Pastor Benjamin's wife, Bernita Benjamin. Uh, she passed away just a few weeks ago at the age of 59, and so uh, we'll be traveling there after service. If, if I don't get a moment to greet you after church or to shake hands with you, please don't be offended. Just understand that uh, it's a little over a three-hour drive, and I've got to be in Pierre, South Dakota by 5 o'clock, uh, and so we're going to be moving quickly to to make it to that funeral today. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. If you're there, say amen. I can make it real easy for you. If you just open the front cover of your Bible and you move past the certificate of who it was presented to and then the list of all the marriages and the table of contents, right there on the first page is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I feel the teach today, but I'm confident at the end of today, God's going to step back into this place, and he has a very specific work that he wants to accomplish in this house today. Amen. I want to teach on this thought, God is. God is. Would you set your Bible to the side one more time? Let's slip a hand into the air and ask God to step into this house. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy, your glory, your power that we feel already in this house. Uh, I pray, God, that angels of the Lord would ascend and descend upon this house. Uh, let there be a guard, God, set over this place that the word of God would find its way to good ground in every heart. Uh, let every distraction be silenced. Uh, let every discouraging voice, God, God, be shut down right now. Uh, I pray that your voice would begin to minister to the ears and to the hearts uh, of every man, woman, and child in this auditorium. In Jesus' name, God is. We live in a world that has many ideas about God. Many have created a concept of God of their own understanding in their own mind after their own ideas. Some even go as far as to doubt his existence. Psalm, Psalm says the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Paul would write in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 that God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky, and through everything that God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they, and by extension us, we today have no excuse for not knowing God. Others create a God in an image and in a mold of their own choosing after what they desire. Paul goes on in Romans and says in verse 21, Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God or even give Him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. It would be inaccurate of us to assume that mankind is not still engaged in this procedure today. 
It might be a little bit less common. It would actually be somewhat shocking to travel to the home of somebody in Watertown, South Dakota, and see that they have fashioned an idol that looks like an eagle or it looks like a frog or, or something like that. But we've, we've tried to fashion God into our own ideas and our own concepts. For many, self has become the idol. My ideas... My concepts, my worldview, a phrase that we hear commonly these days, my truth has been elevated to a place and we have put God over here or tried to put God in a little corner and and we we just kind of pull him out and dust him off when it suits us as long as it fits the pattern that we have decided that God fits into. You've heard the phrase, well, I I don't think God would. Be careful. Be careful. The Bible declares that God, his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Uh, His ways are past finding out. Uh, We as mere humanity should always be careful when we begin to utter the phrase, I don't think that God would. Uh, Because in reality, it does not come down to what you or I think about God. Uh, God is. God was. God always will be. And so whatever conception of God that I hold on to or operate in, if it does not align with what God has revealed about himself, I need to trash it. I need to get rid of it. And I need to align my life with God's identity. God is a personable being. He has likes, he has dislikes, he has a nature, he has emotions. God has things that he enjoys. The Bible goes as far as to tell us that there are some smells that the Lord enjoys. And there are other smells that are detestable to him. There are sounds that he enjoys more, and there are other sounds that he does not enjoy. But he is not a distant being that is not interested in all of humanity. There are those that view God as perhaps, yes, he, he's the creator, we'll, we'll give him that. But he wound it up like a watch and then he just let it go. And they say that all of the universe has unfolded after God has let it go. But the Bible clearly tells us and clearly shows us a God whose hands are still active in this world today. This personable God is interested in a relationship with you. He wants to know you. But if we are going to be in a relationship with God, we must have an accurate understanding of God. Now, do not worry. I am not here today to try to expound on all of God. That would be an impossible task. It would be an enjoyable task. But it would be an impossible task. Creation as Romans says, is a source of knowledge about God. In fact, creation is enough of a revelation of God that nobody will have an excuse for claiming to not know God. The invisible qualities of God are demonstrated in creation, and Paul said we are without excuse. Experience is a source of knowledge about God. If this is your very first time here today, you can now say you have experienced the presence of an almighty God. You've stepped into his presence. You've felt his glory. You've been around God. But scripture is the definitive source of knowledge about God. 
Scripture overrules anything that my mind tells me about creation. Scripture overrules any experience that I may have had, whether in this church or in private prayer or another church. Uh, It does not matter if it aligns with how I want him to behave or exist. Uh, If my view of God does not align with his revelation in Scripture, then I'm wrong and Scripture is right. And until I have a scriptural view of God, I cannot have a scriptural view of myself. We cannot enter into relationship because I don't know him and I don't know me. And any relationship that I try to have with a God uh, that I don't know and with, from a self that I'm not even aware of is going to fail. It's going to falter. The Bible declares many things about God. Job chapter 36 and verse 5, Behold, God is mighty. He despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. Psalm 34 or 94 and 22 says that the Lord is my defense and my God is the rock of my refuge. I'm thankful that at times in my life I have known him as the rock of my refuge. When I'm going through trouble, when I'm going through a hard time, I can lean upon a God who's the rock of my refuge. Psalm 116 and 5 tells us, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is is merciful. So in that verse, we learn three things about God. He is gracious or full of grace. He's righteous or right. He is in right standing. He is pure and he is merciful. I'm thankful that I serve a God that is filled with grace and with mercy and who exists in rightness. There's no error in him. John chapter 4 and verse 24 reveals some things about God that we need to know. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The God of the Bible is invisible to humans unless he himself makes himself visible in some way. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. On and on and on throughout the pages of Scripture, God lets people know things about himself. Not so that we can live in terror and in fear, but so that we can have an accurate understanding of who he is uh, and draw close to him with the appropriate reverence and the appropriate path. There are a couple of attributes of God that I want to focus on today. The first thing that we're going to focus on today is this. God is holy. God is holy. Leviticus 19 and 2 says, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, see, I told you we'd make it to Revelation. We're there already. Don't worry. We're we're like halfway done. Just kidding. Just kidding. But in Revelation, the book which is actually called the Revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, John sees a vision in heaven, and he sees this in Revelation 4 and 8, and he says, The four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Uh, It is indivisible from the nature of God. It is how God describes himself as he introduces himself to his people. It is the sound in heaven being sung around the throne of God right now. Uh, God's holiness is being extolled. It is a virtue of God uh, that is absolutely central to his identity and to an understanding of who God is. God is holy. That means he is perfect, he is pure, he is right. There is no error, there is no wrongness in 
God. Uh, when God called Moses to himself at a burning bush, he said, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. Uh, God's so holy wherever he goes, uh, everything around him becomes uh, saturated with his holiness, with his rightness. The law began to call for the people of God to be holy in every area of their lives. Now, you and I, we, we, we cannot attain that level of absolute purity and righteousness. And so when the Bible speaks of holiness in the, in the lives of the people of God, because God commands us to be holy like he is holy, it's speaking of the degree to which we conform to the nature and to the image of God. Holiness is his image. He calls us to be like him. He calls us to a life of holiness and cleanliness and separation. But you compare this revelation of himself to the nature of the gods of the pagan nations around Israel, and suddenly you get an accurate representation of why this is such a big deal. Do a little research on the sordid backstories of these pantheons of false gods. You would have this God betraying that God, and this God sleeping with that God, and this God hating humans, and this God mistreating any of them. You would have treachery and double-crossing. You would have a fickle nature. Uh, but the one true God, he's holy. He's perfect. He's pure. He's sinless. And this means that he's perfectly trustworthy. This means that he never has a wrong motive when dealing with his children. This means that any relationship you seek after with him uh, will always be with somebody uh, who is never going to cheat on you. He's never going to abandon you. He's never going to mistreat you. He's never going to lie to you. It's important that you understand uh, he's a holy God. Uh, he's a pure God. Uh, and he's a lovely God. God, there's no sin in my God. There's no falseness in my God. There's no error in my God. There's no shadow of turning in my God. My God is perfect. There's no darkness in him. There is only light. There's no error in him. There is only righteousness and truth. Never a lie has come across the lips of my God. It has only been truth. Whether I want to hear it or not, it's been truth after truth after truth. He's a holy God. And I can tell him my deepest secrets. I can confess my darkest failures. And they're safe. They're safe with a holy God. I can give him my life. I can hand over my finances. I can put my children in his hands. I can put my family in his hands. Why? Because they're holy hands. There's no cheating in those hands. There's no lying in those hands. They're holy hands. That's not to say there won't be times that I feel let down. There's going to be times where I feel alone. But I've got to align my perception with reality. You see, my emotions are not yet pure and perfect like God's emotions. Uh, I'm still influenced by the flesh. Uh, I'm still influenced by the things around me. Uh, and Paul answers his charge in Romans chapter 9 and verse 14 and says, What shall we say then? Uh, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. He's a holy God. The next thing we need to know about God is that God is love. God is love. 1 John 4 and 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is is love. What, I want everybody to say those four words together. For God is love. Amen. 
In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Only a perfect, holy God can make this claim and have it be truthful. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 and said, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sinners. With no promise of ever getting a return, the God who is love uh, poured out love for us. The God who is love uh, came and bled and died for us. You see, as humans, we can love. We're called to love. We're called to love unconditionally and without feigning or without faking uh, those around us. There are, there's brotherly love. There's unconditional love. But we have the capacity to love. We gained it from God. But God uh, does not just love. God is love. It's a core part of his nature. God is love. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, now many times when we speak of a God of love in the culture that we live in, people want to think of a God that just pats them on the back, lifts them up, affirms everything that they're doing, never tells them no. Because after all, that's what love is, right? It's, the, it's the, the feelings in our stomach, the butterflies. All the teenagers are like, I don't have a clue what he's talking about. The butterflies in our stomach, it's the, it's the, the, the first dates, it's the times that we can spend together. But that's not an accurate understanding of the nature of a God of love. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5 fills us in a little bit. He says in have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You see, the love of God for you is so great, that a perfect holy God uh, who desires to be in relationship with you will not allow you to remain unbothered in your mess. He loves you so much uh, that he's going to mess with you to try to correct wrong behavior so that you can draw ever closer to him in love. But sometimes we get so bent out of shape and so sideways because God's chastening us uh, and we don't realize that that's actually God's love uh, trying to correct something that is wrong inside of us. He loves me too much for my rebellious, sinful, carnal nature to send me straight to hell without him putting up a fight. Somebody needs to hear me right now. If, if you're going through something and you're wondering where's the love of God, uh, maybe you should start looking and saying, what is God trying to correct in my life? The Bible declares God is a God of love. You're not some special case that God decided he couldn't love and he's just going to punish. No, he loves you, and if you don't feel that love right now, then that means there's an area of your life that he's trying to correct and bring about into alignment with Scripture so that you can again walk with him, a holy, pure, and perfect God who loves you deeply, who hung on a cross and saw your name and saw your sin and decided to do it anyway. I'll take you to the Old Testament, the example of the children of Israel in captivity. Without doubt, Israel was God's chosen people. And they knew it. And they forgot it. They thought 
that just because they were God's chosen people, they could live however they wanted and God was somehow held over a barrel. But God in his love sent prophet after prophet. He sent person after person, miracle after miracle, deliverance after deliverance. Uh, and so many get confused at this stage when all of the sudden uh, the voice of prophecy stops uh, and the love of God requires him to judge and so now the children of Israel who have existed knowing that I'm, I'm the child of God. I'm the child of God. He loves me. I'm special. Find themselves carried off into captivity in the land of Babylon. Well, what kind of loving God? Be careful. Be careful. We've heard that phrase today. Anybody not heard that phrase? Well, what, I, I don't think that a loving God. Oh, come on now. You're, you're judging by human love. God loves you so much, he doesn't want you to go to hell and be separated from him. And so he sends his chosen people into captivity for a period of time. Why? To correct behavior in their life. To deal with attitudes, to deal with carnality, to deal with spiritual things inside of them. Hear me very carefully right now. Uh, God is a God of love. Uh, and your lack of experience of this perceiving of this love uh, is not God's fault. God is trying to correct something inside of you. Here's what God says to the children of Israel the entire time. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 1. They've just gone into captivity. They've been carried off 70 years. And here's what God says to them immediately. At the same time, saith the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were less of the sword uh, found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Uh, therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Uh, again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O version of Israel. Uh, somebody today needs to hear this. You can find the grace and the love of God uh, in the wilderness that you are in right now. Uh, why? Because he's the God of love, uh, and he's the one that sent you into the wilderness uh, because his love that was reaching for you was being ignored. Uh, and so a God of love said, fine, uh, you've got to go through a hard time uh, and a period where you can't get to me. Uh, but never doubt and never fear uh, that nail-scarred hands are reaching for you. Why? Uh, because God uh, is love. And he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. The final and last thing we need to know about God today. Are we doing all right? is a truth that has been under attack from the day it was first declared. God is holy. Incidentally, he calls us to be holy. God is love, and he calls us to love. And God is one. He calls us to be one. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 sets forward this truth. It was, it's called to the, the Jews today the Shema. It is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. It was God speaking through Moses what God had told Moses back at a burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, when Moses says, Well, who do I say that sent me? God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. From this I am that I am, we get what is known as the tetragrammaton or uh, commonly, it's, it's Yahweh or Jehovah. 
It means that he is the self-existing one. God was saying, I was, I am, I is, if you got bad English, I will be. He's declaring himself to be the God that existed from before creation and the God that's going to exist long after creation. When everything wraps up and the element burns with a fervent heat, he is. He's there. Throughout the Old Testament, God continued to reveal himself through various compound names. The children of Israel would come to know him as Jehovah Jireh or Jehovah our provider. They would come to know him as Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals us. He, he would begin to heal his people. God revealing more and more of himself. And we arrive in Isaiah at Isaiah 9 and 6. Uh, and God uh, begins to pull back the curtain even further uh, and speak of a day which will come and says, for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the everlasting father the mighty God the prince of peace you fast forward all the way to John chapter 1 and verse 1 uh, and God continues to reveal more of himself to his creation uh, it reads in the beginning was the word and the word was with God uh, and the word was was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And in verse 14, John uh, John just pulls back the curtain all the way and says this, and the word which was God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, we already read Genesis 1-1 as our opening text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And even then, God uh, in creation knew uh, that he would eventually have to come uh, and redeem to himself a people. And this plan was in the mind of God before Adam and Eve ever failed and sinned. Uh, before the body of Jesus ever existed, uh, the plan was in the mind of Jehovah. The God that fills all time and all space came bodily as a man to live on the earth. And that man was Jesus Christ. Paul is already facing an attack on this understanding and revelation in the book of Colossians. Because Paul writes and says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and through vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, uh, and not after Christ. Why? For in him, that's who? That's in Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power you see you are not when you're calling on the name of Jesus you're not getting a piece of God uh, or just an attribute of God uh, but when you speak that name of Jesus the highest revealed name of God uh, what you are getting uh, is the I am from the burning bush uh, is in standing in flesh uh, robed uh, in flesh as the incarnate nation of the almighty God uh, and you uh, are complete in him when you speak the name of Jesus uh, it's the holy God we're learning about uh, the holy God at a burning bush uh, and the holy God on the one throne in heaven uh, it's all encapsulated it's all contained uh, in one simple name uh, the name of Jesus And we're complete in that name. We're not lacking anything. We're not looking for anything else. We're complete in Jesus. He is the head of all principality and power. Now the Jews of his day, they would not receive this. In John chapter 8, 
Jesus is going back and forth with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Jews say unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now that don't make very good sense in English. That's not how a sentence works. But when you're the originator of all language, you can speak however you want. God was saying, God incarnated in the flesh was saying, look, I knew Abraham pretty well. I called him friend. In Genesis 15 and 1, I told him that I was his shelter and his strength and his reward. And so, hey, Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. I still am. I still will be. Abraham's dead and gone, but here am I. And the Pharisees understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Because they took up stones to chuck them at Jesus. The disciples even had trouble at times. Grasping the nature of Jehovah incarnate in flesh in front of them. In John chapter 14, in a conversation with his disciples as they're enjoying the Last Supper. I mean, we're talking the Last Supper. Like the day before Jesus is due to be glorified. Crucified, then glorified. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus looks at Philip and says, have I been so long time with you, and you don't know me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. Uh, Jesus' response to his earnest disciples' request to see the Father was, you're looking at him. I'm right here, Philip. This is what you're going to see. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be three thrones. There is going to be one throne. Uh, and we're going to see uh, the only representation of the Father that there ever has been. Uh, there's going to be Jesus seated on the throne. Uh, why? Because when you lay eyes uh, on Jesus Christ, you are laying eyes on the Father uh, that created the entire world. Uh, the one that spoke the universe into existence. If you've seen Jesus, uh, you've seen the Father. But the disciples eventually got there because after Jesus' resurrection in Matthew 28 and 19, he says, Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son uh, and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the disciples got this. They understood exactly what Jesus was talking about because in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 when the crowd says, what do we need to do to be saved? Uh, Peter and the 11 apostles with him stand up uh, and they say, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name uh, of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh, it's in the name uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's got 11 sidekicks with him. Uh, he's got 11 dudes with him uh, that heard Jesus say, baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, if Peter had it wrong, uh, somebody would have jerked his coattails and said, hey, Pete. Uh, but Peter and the 11 understood uh, what the Jesus Church understands today. Uh, when you call on the name of Jesus, uh, you're calling on the name of the Father uh, and of the Son uh, and of the Holy Ghost. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, those are titles, uh, but there's one name, uh, and it is Jesus. Uh, Jehovah is become uh, my salvation. Uh, the God uh, that led him out of Israel uh, or out of Egypt uh, took flesh on himself uh, and led him out of sin uh, once and for all. That's the God uh, that we serve. They would go on in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 to declare, uh, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men uh, whereby we must be saved. Uh, the salvation is in uh, the name of Jesus. Uh, it is in the name of Jesus. 
Our God is one. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10 says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is No Savior. Isaiah would go on in chapter 44 and verse 6 to say, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Uh, But then you go back to the book of Revelation, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, as John would pen it uh, as the closing book to the uh, the New Testament canon. uh, And he sees Jesus uh, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 uh, and when he sees him he fell at his feet as dead uh, and Jesus lays his right hand upon him and says fear not uh, I am the first and the last now I don't know about you but you can't have two firsts and two lasts you can't have two alphas and two omegas And so what you have uh, is the God of the Old Testament uh, that has revealed himself to the highest degree to his creation, still declaring, uh, I am Alpha and I'm Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21, it says, Tell me and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from the ancient time and who hath told it from the time? Have not I the Lord... And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, uh, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, uh, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. uh, That unto me every knee shall bow, uh, and every tongue shall swear. uh, But then Paul gets to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8 writing about Jesus Christ and it says, and being found in fashion uh, as a man, he humbled himself and became uh, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God uh, hath highly exalted him uh, and given him a name that is above every name, uh, that at the name of Jesus. Uh, Every knee should bow uh, of things in heaven uh, and things in the earth uh, and things under the earth, uh, and that every tongue should confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord uh, to the glory of God the Father. Uh, The God of the Old Testament saying, uh, every knee's gonna bow to me, uh, is the God of the New Testament incarnate in human form saying, uh, every knee's gonna bow to me. uh, And we're so blessed to know the name. We are blessed uh, to know the name. What's that name? Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1 call Jesus the express image of God. Colossians calls him the express image of his invisible person. We read already in John, he is the living word incarnate. He is God manifested in flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19 says, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. You see, God incarnated himself in the body of Jesus to reconcile his creation back to himself. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Our God is one. Our God is one. Uh, scripture does not struggle to reconcile Deuteronomy 6.4 uh, with any other portion of Scripture. Uh, but when you have a proper revelation of the nature of God uh, and you will stand on the truth of God and not the traditions of men, uh, your understanding will open uh, and your access to the power of God uh, will grow. Why? Because when you understand uh, that it all comes in the name of Jesus, Are we doing good on time? Zechariah chapter 11. 
Verse 11. Old Testament. Jehovah speaking. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, speaking to the prophet, cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. In the New Testament, we find Jesus, our Savior, bought for 30 pieces of silver. Of silver. Why? Uh, it's the Jehovah of the Old Testament incarnated in flesh and walking among his creation. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 it says, And I will pour out on the house of David uh, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. His creation would look upon the Creator in flesh that they had pierced. You see, it ties together. It ties together. Our God is one. And this is important, and it has to be fought for, because the traditions of men the philosophies of men, the rudiments of this world have clouded the minds of them that believe not. Now James, chapter 2 and verse 19, as we stand together today, lets us know this. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Somebody with a revelation of Jesus Christ that is not afraid to call on the name of Jesus Christ can cause hell to tremble. Well, one more verse and then we're going to have a time of prayer as we close. Why did we take all this time today to define who God is Maybe you're saying it's, it's, it's semantics. No, it's, it's not semantics. It's Scripture. God has told us everything we need to know about Himself. In Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32, it says, Such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You see, when you've got an understanding of the nature of God and the identity of God, it empowers you to do the work of God as the child of God. When you understand that God is holy, He is perfect, He is pure, and He is worthy of your trust, you can place everything in His hands. When you understand that he is a God of love, he loves you and he loves Watertown. He loves Brookings. Uh, he loves this region. Uh, and with everlasting love, he is trying to draw them to himself. That's his nature, uh, then it begins to stir something inside of you. Uh, but when you understand uh, that you have access to all the power of God, uh, because all the Godhead dwell bodily in Christ Jesus, uh, then you've got power uh, on your tongue, uh, because you can begin to speak the name of Jesus uh, and begin to advance his kingdom uh, in this earth. But the enemy would love nothing more than for you to feel insecure and feel like you're just a small number of people uh, that has revelation of the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he'd love to shut you up and shut you down. Uh, but I've come today uh, to challenge a church uh, to never shut up uh, about the name of Jesus. Uh, never stop talking uh, about the name of Jesus. Uh, never stop declaring uh, the nature of 
of Jesus uh, never stop declaring uh, scripture's revelation uh, that here, O Israel, uh, the Lord our God is one. Uh, there's only one God. Uh, there's only one God. Uh, his name uh, is Jesus. Uh, is anybody else excited about that in this place? You see, we come to prayer meetings on Tuesday nights. Uh, we ought to be declaring who Jesus is. Uh, we come into a, you're praying in your home and in your neighborhood. Uh, every single time, you ought to be speaking that name of Jesus uh, and declaring it over every stronghold in your home, uh, in your neighborhood, and in this city. Why? Uh, in him uh, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead uh, bodily. Uh, we're complete in him. He's the head uh, of all principality and power. Uh, the spirits of addiction in Watertown, uh, they have to bow at the name of Jesus. Uh, the spirits of false doctrine in Watertown, uh, they have to bow at the name of Jesus. Uh, those spirits of depression uh, and suicide, uh, they have to bow uh, at the name of Jesus. Uh, just start speaking uh, scripture. Uh, just start declaring uh, the word of God into your situation uh, and into your problem uh, and watch your problem uh, begin to change. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 says, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So as we close today, I know that there are needs in the house. I know that there are people that have come hurting, that have come broken, that have come confused, that have come doubting. But I've come today to tell you the answer, and the answer is Jesus. And so what we're going to do is we're going to open these altars, and what we're going to do is just begin to declare the name of Jesus. Uh, I want you to say every scripture I want you to quote every piece of the Bible about God that you can. I want you to declare everything in the nature of God that you can. If you run out of things to say, just go back to the top and start speaking it into the atmosphere that Jesus is God. He's the one on the throne. And so as we lift our hands in this place, if you have a need in your life today, I've come to tell you that Jesus is here and he wants to meet your need. I'll open these altars right now. Uh, I don't care what the need is. Uh, I don't know what the need is. Uh, but if you'll come today, Jesus is going to meet your need. Uh, come on, saints of God. Uh, let's just begin to lift up the name of Jesus. Uh, let's just begin to declare that name of Jesus. Uh, let's just begin to extol that name of Jesus. Uh, come on, devils tremble at the name uh, of Jesus. Uh, demons flee uh, at the name uh, of Jesus. That's it. Uh, that's it. Uh, come Come on, lift up that name. Uh, lift up that name together. Lift up that name together. Uh, Jesus is King of Kings. Uh, Jesus is the Lord of Lords. Uh, Jesus is the God uh, that created this universe. Uh, there's power in that name. 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 Uh,